Good evening and welcome to MR News. I am Ash. No, I'm Andrew. Tonight on Magnetic Recording News, we go back in time to our reporters based in the field. From the invention of the magnetic board in Germany to the more popular recognized tape recorder. Stay tuned for these stories and more on Magnetic Recording News. In 1998, Waldemar Poulsen invented a magnetic wire recorder which involved the use of a magnetizable medium that moves past a recording head. An electrical signal which is analogous to the sound that is to be recorded is fed to the recording head inducing a pattern of magnetization similar to the signal. A playback head which can be the same as a recording head can then pick up the magnetic field from the tape and convert them into an electrical signal. We cross now to Regina who was in 1935, outside the Berlin radio show. Regina, are you there? Regina, what can you tell us about this new device dubbed the magnetophone? How did it all come to be shown there at the Berlin Radio Show? We have just received a report that Adolf Hitler has placed an order for some magnetophones. In other news, in 1921, AC BIOS was first patented by W. L. Carson and Glenn L. Carpenter. We cross live to Jenny in the studio. Hi there, Andrew. This process, AC BIOS, as you already know, was first patented by W. L. Carson and Glenn L. Carpenter. AC BIOS is the addition of inaudible high frequency signal generally from 40 to 150 kilohertz to the audio signal. The reduction in distortion and noise provided by AC bias was rediscovered in 1940 by Walter Weber. So how did AC bias affect sound recording? Well, Ash, I thought you'd never ask. AC bias helped to reduce the horrible noise on magnetic tape. It took this... By 1943, German engineers had developed a high-quality form of magnetic tape, sound recording that was unknown elsewhere. The Nazi radio networks used it to broadcast music and propaganda around the clock. We have with us in the studio today, Purple, who can shed some light on how this German technology became American. Thanks, Ash. In 1945, at the end of World War II, Jack Mullen was charged with the duty of fishing out German technology. One day, he was in a German radio station and had for the first time an AC-BIOS Hi-Fi magnetophone. 
I'd never heard anything like that in my life before. I couldn't hear any background noise. Very clean, no distortion that I was able to hear. He then copied the blueprints and shipped over two surplus machines to America. And over the next two years, he worked on the machines, modifying them and improving their performance. So, uh, what was Jack Mullen aiming to do with his modified versions of the magnetophone? Well, Mullen's main hope was to interest Hollywood movie studios in using magnetic tape for movie sound recording. And in 1947, Mullen introduced his Americanized tape recorders at MGM Studios in Hollywood. In the audience that day was Bing Crosby's technical director, Murdo McKinsey. Bing Crosby was a multimedia star. From 1934 to 1954, Crosby was a leader in record sales, radio ratings, and motion picture crosses. McKenzie arranged for Mullen to meet Crosby, and in June 1947, Crosby was given a demonstration of Mullen's magnetic tape recorders. And what did Bing Crosby think of this new technology? Crosby was impressed by the amazing sound quality and instantly saw the huge commercial potential of the new machines. Up to this time, most pre-recorded programming such as serials and drama were produced on disc, but live music was the standard for American radio at the time, and radio networks tightly res restricted the use of music on disc because of the comparatively poor sound quality. Did Crosby and Mullen end up working with each other? Crosby found live radio to be a chore, so when he heard this new and improved way of recording, he hired Jack Mullen to record and edit his show for later broadcast. The little piece of tape that I'm going to play on here was actually recorded in 1947, and it still sounds as good as it ever did. Where the blue of the night meets the gold of the day. Welcome back to Magnetic Recording News. We are here with our lovely reporters, Diva Dave and Jenny, discussing the pros and cons of magnetic recording. Yes, we are, Ash. Now, Jenny, can we start with you on the pros of the magnetic recording? Um, what are your thoughts on the pros compared to the technology that was pre-magnetic recording? Well, Andrew, let's start simple. Before magnetic recording, almost all music was recorded onto cylinders and recorders, which, if it weren't looked after, could sound just horrible. But thanks to magnetic recording and AC bias, sound could be captured with almost no noise or distortion. Magnetic tape was able to record higher frequencies than all technology before it could not. Magne magnetic tape was also easy to overwrite and reuse, and all you would need is a pair of scissors and some sticky tape. You could also have immediate playback after recording, and unlike microgrove records, you could record a lot more than 20 minutes, depending on how much tape you had. Well, that's amazing, Jenny. How did this technology impact future technology? Mm -hmm. Well, Ash, magnetic recording directly led us to some very important inventions, like how Les Paul used multiple tape recorders to record his music, which was eventually named multi-tracking. Even things like voicemail and videotape was made available with magnetic recording. And in 1951, magnetic recording was the start of data storage. By the 1960s, it was so popular that everyone had a tape player in their home, and it became the universal way to listen to pre-recorded music. Mm hmm Well, that's amazing, Jenny. Now, um, 
Diva Dave, what can you say with the cause of magnetic recording? I think we can all agree that at the time magnetic recording was just super amazing. But as time went on, newer technology surpassed it quite quickly. By 1978, when the first uh, US digitally recorded classical release, uh, audio engineers were starting to see that magnetic tape was not the best way to capture sound. Uh, what they found was that magnetic systems took a lot of money to run and took up more storage capacity that digital technology didn't. They also found that it took quite a lot of time to write and read from a wound film, which led to higher costs in employee involvement in storage facilities. I mean, compared to the 10 millisecond random access time of standard hard drives, the use of multiple motors and moving parts each of which is susceptible to mechanical failure, whereas in the realm of digital media, flash-based memory uses no moving parts, thus eliminating this problem. Today we are with Professor Gavika, who will explain to us the recording styles back in time. Uh, yes, uh, well actually, uh, Ezra is uh, Professor Gavika. Oh, I apologise. Uh, but thank you, Ezra. Uh, back in the days, I'd like to start about back in the days. Uh, back in the days, we didn't have, uh, have separate recording rooms for, uh, for vocalists. And we surely didn't have uh, the technology back then to record uh, what you would say, uh, the orchestra and then the vocalist. Uh, you had to record everyone, everybody, your family, your cousins, everyone, at the same time, all in one go. Uh, as you can see in this diagram that uh, I have on my clipboard, uh, will show up on the screen. Uh, this diagram here, uh, we have set up a symphony orchestra for a three-channel stereophonic recording. Each section accordingly plays along with a microphone or two, especially large RCA44s. Uh, they were ribbons that were overhead, uh, hanging just above the vocals. Uh, or the violin section, beautiful sound. Uh, or the woodwind section, and uh, so forth in 15 uh, Ribbons are a side address, okay? So not front, not back, on the side. On the left side, right, any side. Um, they, they're their side address, okay? Uh, which means they, uh, they pick up sound in a, what do you call, a, a bi-directional? Uh, a bi-directional or figure eight, that's sort of like my body. Uh, in other words, they pick up sound from both uh, black and the front. Uh, you get what I mean? Uh, the, the back and the front of the microphone. That is so amazing, Professor, but wouldn't the large sound of um, a symphony orchestra over overpower the vocalist? It's a good question. Good question. Good Thank question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, mm. Okay. Okay. Um, the the vocalist. Okay, but the vocalist would most likely have a microphone closer to them, uh, but here. Okay, and they would sing directly towards uh, the microphone. As you can see by my good friend uh, Frank Sinatra, yeah, I'll show you a picture of him. Just me and him at, um, at the, the winery down in South Island. Yeah, very good. Very yeah. beautiful. Thank you. Wow, well, must have been tough for the audio engineer recording back then. Indeed, indeed, indeed it was, Ash. Indeed it was. Um, I know of a book, uh, I think it's called uh, Sessions with uh, Frank Sinatra, or, or Sessions with Sinatra, actually. Uh, Frank Sinatra, and uh, as, as in my notes here somewhere, uh, The Art of Recording by Charles L. Granata, uh, is one of my cousins. Uh, we learn from uh, Frank Olaika, yeah, sort of like me, but no, uh, that he had to be careful, especially since really, uh, you know, early recording sessions, they were live, you know, there was, there was no camera, you know, no, none of these things. Um, and they were monophonic, very monophonic. Just the single track, you know, one thing happened, one balance. And, uh, and they were mixed on the spot, you know. Um, 
without the, the, the technique to actually edit or, or fix any of the, the technical uh, or performance errors, you know, when someone sings the wrong words for the song. Um, but engineers of that era were truly remarkable. And able to, uh, to sweep, uh, uh, to, to keep a nice, well-balanced sound. Oh, thank you very much, Professor, for that explanation. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, I'm on. And now, I'll recap of all our stories. In 1928, Fritz Feumer invented the magnetophone based on Waldemar Poulsen's invention of the magnetic wire recording. And in 1936, Sir Thomas Beecham conducted the first recording of the London Philharmonic Orchestra. And in 1940, Wolfgang Weber rediscovered AC bias that increased the signal quality of all, almost all audio recordings that used magnetic tape. In early 1947, John T. Mullins introduced his Americanized tape recorder at MGM Studios in Hollywood, which revolutionized the music industry. And in June 1947, Bing Crosby was the first Hollywood star to have his show recorded for later broadcasts. That's all from us here at Magnetic Recording News. We hope you've enjoyed this bulletin. For these stories and more, please visit our website, www.mrn.com. You can find behind the scenes in a bloopers reel at our Facebook group, Suit Audio Altai. And from all of us here in the studio, and all our reporters in the field, good, good luck, luck, good night, and God, God bless. bless.